8. Karnaparva 1. Radheya in command The fifteenth day of the Great War had ended disastrously for the Korovs. Evening had fallen, and the two armies had returned to their camps. In the night Duryodhan and the others sat in conference, trying to think of a way out of their predicament. He asked them all to give their opinions. The wise Ashvatthama spoke. He said, We want a man who is fond of you, who is capable, efficient and also powerful. Such a man will be able to command the army and lead you to victory. All the heroes assembled here are rich in these qualities. There is no need for you to be depressed. We are all ready to die for you. If Radheya is made the commander of the army, we are sure of victory. Radheya is invincible. Duryodhan was overjoyed to hear the suggestion of Ashvatthama. Hope does not die in the heart of man, not as long as there is life in the body. Even after the fall of Bhishma and Drona, the king had hopes of winning the war with Radheya as the commander of the army. Duryodhan looked at Radheya with eyes full of affection and said, Radheya, I know your greatness. I also know the affection you have for me. I now depend on you to steer me over these difficult days. Bhishma and Drona fought valiantly for me, and they have both fallen. Bhishma was always fond of the Pandavas. After him we installed Drona as the commander according to your advice. Both have fallen, both by unfair means. They were attacked when they were without weapons. Two defenseless men have been killed by the enemies. But both of them were fighting without their full vigor. They did not want to hurt the five Pandavas. Drona was too fond of Arjun to fight to his utmost. But you are different. For the first time in this war, I am leaving my army in the hands of one who hates the Pandavas as much as I do. You must lead us all as Kartike led the host of the Divine Army. I ask you very humbly to take up this great task. Radheya was very happy to hear the words of the king. At last the time had come when he could repay the debt of affection and gratitude which he owed Duryodhan. He said, Nothing will please me more than to do this service for you, my king. I will destroy Arjun in the battle tomorrow and lay the world at your feet. I am eager to fight with them all, and I am eager to kill Arjun. I am sure to kill him. Duryodhan installed him as the commander. Radheya was given the coronation bath and was formally installed as the third commander of the Korov army. Duryodhan thought the world to be already his since his Radheya was the commander. The sixteenth day of the great war dawned. It was wonderful to see Radheya at the head of the army. He looked splendid like the sun which had just risen in the east. He wanted to arrange the army in the Makaravaya. The mouth of the Makara was Radheya. The eyes were Shakuni and his son Aluk. At the head was stationed Ashvatthama. The neck was made up of the sons of Dhritarashtra. At the center could be seen Duryodhan with his serpent banner. The left foreleg was made up of Kritvarma and his army. The right hind leg was in the keeping of Sushana, the son of Radheya. The left hind leg was in the charge of Salia. The right foreleg was made up of Kripa and his army. The tail was made up of some other brothers of Duryodhan. Looking at the array of the Korovs with Radheya as the commander, Yudhishthir said, Arjun, look at this army of the Korovs with Radheya in the van. When I think of the same army just sixteen days back, when our grandfather had arranged it in the terrible Vaya, which was impenetrable, and now when I see it arranged in the Makaravaya, I do realize the dwindling in the size. What a great calamity has befallen these men. Think of all the many heroes who were moving about then on the first day like meteors shooting across the sky. Look on their army now. What a sad contrast. Look on Radheya. He is splendid. He is like the moon in the midst of stars. He is the one person on their side who is to be feared. Arjun, if you kill just this one man, victory is ours. There is no one else worth mentioning. Arjun saw the truth of his remarks. He looked at his army. It had also suffered at the hands of the two commanders Bhishma and Drona and at the hands of Ashvatthama. 
he arranged it in the form of a crescent. The left horn had Beam guarding it. The light horn had the one and only Drishtad home to guard it. At the center was Arjun, behind him were Yudhishthir, Nakul and Sahdev. Arjun's chariot wheels were as usual protected by Yedhamenu and Uttamauja. The other heroes were placed all along the two sides of the crescent. The trumpets and war drums made music and the two armies clashed. It was somewhat like the first day's battle. The same procedure was adopted. Drona's unorthodox methods of fighting was a contrast to the more dignified procedure of Radhaya. It reminded everyone of Bhishma's fine and righteous leadership. The Korovs were able to forget the loss of Bhishma and Drona when they saw the brave and handsome Radhaya in their van. Early during the fight Beam was able to kill the proud king Keshi Madhuri. Radhaya advanced towards the Pandav army. He was destroying it ruthlessly. Nukul came to the front and accosted Radhaya. Beam and Ashvatthama met in a duel. Satyaki met Vinda and Anuvinda, the Kekaya brothers on the side of the Korovs. Not to be confused with the Avanti brothers who were killed by Arjun on the 14th day's battle. The king fought with Yudhishthir. What was left of the Samsapteka army challenged Arjun. Kripa fought with Drishtadhum and Shikhandi with Kritvarma. Sritakuti met Salia. Sahdev challenged the powerful Dasashun. Vinda and Anuvinda were killed by Satyaki after a spectacular fight. The sons of the Rupadi were doing excellent work. The fight was going on between Bhim and Ashvatthama. Ashvatthama was defeated by Bhim and was carried out of the field by his charioteer. Sritakuti was defeated by Salia. Sahdev defeated Dasashun. An interesting duel was fought between Radhaya and Nakul. Nakul was advancing into the army of the Korovs with the speed of fire. With the intention of stopping him, Radhaya advanced and stationed himself in front of his chariot. Nukul was pleased with his coming. He said, God is indeed good to me. I have been wanting to meet you since so many days. It is because of you that this Korov army is being destroyed by us. You are the root cause of all this evil. If I kill you today, a thorn will be removed from my mind. Come and fight with me. Radhaya smiled his supercilious smile. But he spoke words which went well with his chivalry, and his noble birth he spoke as one great archer should to another archer. He said, You are a great warrior. I am glad to meet you in single fight. Be a man and show your prowess. Let me see if you can do what you propose to do. Fight to the best of your power, and I promise you I will fight back and sting your pride. The fight began. Both were bent on destroying each other. Nikula's bow was cut at the outset. He took up another bow and continued to fight. Radhaya's bow was cut now and they both took up new bows and fought on. The fight went on for quite a long time. It was very much like the dual fight between Beam and Radhaya on the day when Jadrath fell. After that Radhaya had fought with Sahdev. It was Nikula's turn today to be defeated by Radhaya. Nikul soon found that he had lost his bow, his horses, his charioteer. He was on the ground. He took up his sword, and that was cut away from his hand. The technique of Radhaya was typical of him. He cut Nikula's shield and his mace. The wheel of the chariot which he took up in his hand was broken by Radhaya. Nikul was absolutely helpless. Radhaya laughed his taunting laugh. Nukul turned his face away from that laugh and fled from the presence of Radhaya. He could not bear that laugh. Any more. But Radhaya would not let him go. Nukul was caught from behind by the bow of Radhaya. He had thrown it round the neck of the retreating Nukul who felt so very humiliated. Radhaya smiled cruelly at him. He said, so, all that you said was just boasting. I find that you have not been able to do what you promised to do. Let me hear again those words of bravado which greeted me at the beginning of the duel. My dear Nakul, let this be a lesson to you. Do not try to fight with your superiors. I am far superior to you. 
I am repeating it for your own good. Fight with your equals. There is nothing in being defeated by your superior. Do not be ashamed of this duel with me. Someday, someday, Knuckle, you will remember this duel which you fought with me. I tell you again, do not be ashamed of the fact that I defeated you. Be proud of it. Be proud of the fact that you once fought a duel with the great Radhaya. Go home now, my child. Go home, or go to Arjun and Krishn. Radhaya smiled once again, and released Nakul from the noose of his bow. He went away bent on destroying the army. Sighing like a serpent which had been cruelly hurt, Nakul went to Yudhishthir. No one saw the tears that glistened at the corners of Radhaya's eyes. No one except Krishn. He smiled to himself as if to say, Radhaya is remembering that Nakul is his brother. He will not kill any of the Pandavs except Arjun. But poor Nakul would rather have been killed than be humiliated like this. But it is all part of the game. He must learn to face this also once in a way. 2.16th day Radhaya's fury was something terrible. The army of the Pandavs was not able to withstand the power of the arrows which were flowing in an unending stream. Not a single arrow was futile. Each claimed a life. It was not possible for the Pandavs to do anything about it. Still the army went towards him like a flock of moths against a flame. It was just like that. Radhaya was burning like the sun. No one could find courage enough to fight with him. No one could even challenge him. It was midday. The fight was raging fiercely. There were several more duels fought. Yuyetsa fought with Uluk and was defeated. Shakuni fought with Sudasoma, and the duel which Kripa fought with Drishtadhum was worth watching. Kripa wanted to avenge the death of Drona, and Drishtadhum knew it. He could not stand the fierce arrows of Kripa. He was overcome with fainting, and he went away from the presence of Kripa. But Kripa followed him and kept on harassing him and the Pandav army. He was like Drona today. No one could stop him from destroying the army. Shikhandi was fighting a duel with Kritvarma. He did not fare well either. He was wounded and he too had to leave the presence of Kritvarma, admitting defeat. Kripa, Kritvarma, and Radhaya were bent on destroying the army. Arjun, of course, was excellent. The Korov army was like a huge pile of cotton caught in a gale. He was accosted by the Samsaptakas who were still left alive. Most of them were killed and the rest fled away in panic. Duryodhan fought with Yudhishthir. It was a very interesting duel. Duryodhan was a Maharadika, and his heart was singing when he saw the enemy army being scorched up by Radhaya and Kritvarma. Duryodhan was fighting well today. But Yudhishthir defeated him easily. The first four arrows killed the four horses of the king. The fifth killed his charioteer. The sixth tore away his banner, and the seventh broke his bow. The army was watching this feat with amazed eyes. The eighth arrow tossed the sword of Duryodhan from his hand. The next five were enough to hurt him. The arrows followed each other so swiftly that Duryodhan had no time even to think. Seeing his condition, Radhaya, Ashvatthama and Kripa hurried to his assistance. Other warriors surrounded Yudhishthir and the fight became general. It was well past midday. Bhim was almost like Arjun, so fast was the rate at which the army was melting at his touch. Duryodhan fought again with Yudhishthir. He had not forgiven him for humiliating him earlier in the day. Yudhishthir was only too happy to oblige. The fight went on longer. Finally Yudhishthir threw a javelin at him, and the king fainted because of a wound in the chest. Kritvarma came and took him away. The war raged on till the end of the day. A large portion of the army on either side had been slaughtered. But nothing remarkable happened on the sixteenth day of the Great War, the first day of the leadership of Radhaya. The sun sloped his way towards the west. The fight went on long after that. The soldiers were scared that the fight might continue far into the night, as it had happened once before. 
they all tried to leave the field even before they were asked to withdraw. The two armies were withdrawn. There was not much celebration on either side, nor was there much depression. It was again like the first day of the war when the noble Bishm was the commander. 3. The Last Night of Radhaya Duryodhan must have been disappointed when he saw that Radhaya did not kill Arjun. He must have noticed too the duel which Radhaya fought with Nakul. He must have seen that Nakul was not killed when Radhaya could easily have done so. But the king did not speak a single word in criticism. He was so fond of Radhaya that he had never once spoken harshly to him. He knew too that Radhaya was just as disappointed at the fact that Arjun was still alive. Just before they parted to go to their tents, Radhaya wrung his hands together and said, Arjun fights well, he is skillful and he is very clever. He has a charioteer who can tell him what he should do, and it is the skill of Krishna that is keeping Arjun alive. But tomorrow, I will do the needful. My lord, tomorrow I will achieve what I have sworn to achieve. His hands were grasped with affection by Duryodhan who said, I know it, Radhaya. I know it. All the heroes had retired for the night. The thoughts of all of them hovered round Radhaya. Radhaya went to the tent of Duryodhan. It was late in the night. They were alone, discussing the plans for the morning. Radhaya knew that he was the one man on whom Duryodhan was depending for his victory. They were together for a long time. In his heart Radhaya knew that it was their last night together. Radhaya said, Duryodhan, I want you to know the facts of the case. Arjun and I are to meet tomorrow. Nothing will stop this meeting. Either I will win by killing him, or I will lose my life. I will not return to the camp without either of these things being decided. Now, my lord, I must tell you about the merits of both of us. I am superior, far superior to Arjun. I do not want to brag about it as our worthy Kripa puts it, but I am stating the facts. Both of us have the divine astras at our command. But in grace and power I am far superior to Arjun. I know it. I have a bow called Vijay which was given to me by Bhargav. It is superior to Arjun's Gandiv. This my bow was made by Visvakarma specially for Indra. It was given to my guru by Indra, and he gave it to me. I am superior to Arjun in that also. Tomorrow I will kill Arjun and place the world at your dear feet. I will then have paid my debt of love to the most wonderful king. But now I will tell you why Arjun is superior to me. His bow is divine and his quivers are inexhaustible. Arjun's chariot is also divine. His horses are divine and his banner has the great Hanuman presiding over it. Krishna, the protector of the universe, is holding the reins of his horses. These three things make him the superior fighter. I am superior to Arjun. But I have no good charioteer. If I have Salia as my charioteer, I am sure to win the war. Salia is like the great Krishna. Actually Salia is superior to Krishna. Even as I am in fighting, Salia is unequaled in the art of driving a chariot. Krishna knows the Aswaradeya but Salia is a past master in the art. If only Salia agrees to be my charioteer, you can be sure of Arjun being killed in tomorrow's battle. I am sure of it. But it is up to you to coax Salia. It is not going to be easy. But Duryodhan, I depend on your gentle powers of persuasion. You can make anyone do anything for you. You have that gift. My lord. Radhaya smiled a very sweet smile, and Duryodhan embraced him with affection. It was the last night they were to spend together. Duryodhan did not know it. But Radhaya knew that he would meet his death tomorrow. He was ready for it. Duryodhan said, I will do it, Radhaya. I will coax Salia to do this for me. He will not refuse. Go and rest in peace. You have a difficult day ahead of you. Radhaya lingered out of the tent. His heart was there. At the entrance of the tent he stood and looked back at Duryodhan. 
He was also looking at the retreating back of his beloved Radhaya. Radhaya rushed back and embraced Duryodhan once again. Duryodhan was touched by the affection of his friend. They shed tears together and then they parted. Radhaya stumbled out of the tent. Radhaya lay down on his bed. He tried to sleep. But how could sleep come to his eyes which were burning like live coals? His heart was beating fast. He was to meet his death tomorrow. Fatalist that he was, still, he was finding it so difficult, so hard, to reconcile himself to the end. It was to be no ordinary fight. He had to fight with his dear brother, and he must try his best to kill him. If everything were normal there was every chance of his killing Arjun. Radhaya smiled a bitter smile. How could he expect? Everything to be normal. Had anything about his life been normal so far? Now, at the end of it, why should it be normal? Krishna sat there holding the reins of Arjun's white horses. Arjun would win. It was known to Radhaya. He knew too, that Salia would not be to him what Krishna was to Arjun. There was a bond between them that was not present between him and Salia. Actually Salia did not like him even. But that was all beside the point. He would fight as well as he could. He knew that in the end he would die, and so would Duryodhan. Yudhishthir would rule the world, and he did deserve it after all the many sufferings he had gone through. Radhaya thought of his two mothers. He thought of Radha, the mother who was so proud of him. He thought of Kunthi. He thought of her sad sweet eyes and her gentle touch. He thought of the few moments he had spent with her, and he brushed away his tears. They were so futile. He was not able to banish all the many thoughts of the past which crowded in his mind and clamored for attention. He saw again the insect which had hurt him in the thigh years back, when he was in the ashrama of Bhargav. The scar was still there. The scar of the consequences was still in his mind too. His guru had said that he would forget the divine incantations when he needed them most. He would need it all tomorrow and he knew that he would forget it all tomorrow. There was no doubt about it. The curse of the Brahmin said that his chariot wheel would get sunk in the mire, and that he would be killed when he was not prepared for it. Yes, the dice was loaded very heavily against him. But he did not care. Radhaya welcomed the thought of death. It would be so restful after the painful life he had to live all these years. He would no longer be called upon to do those dreadful things like killing a child in cold blood, the child of his brother. He would not have to insult his brothers any more by touching them with the tip of his bow and see the tears of humiliation in their eyes. It was not easy for him to insult Nakul that day. It would have been easier to kill him. Yes, Nakul would feel proud that he had fought that duel with his brother and had been insulted by him. He smiled again. He would try and fight with Yudhishthir tomorrow and insult him too. Kunthi must know that he had all the Pandavs at his mercy, but did not kill any of them. He had given her that boon of his own accord, and she must know that Radhaya was a man who kept his promise. Krishn was keeping his promise. He knew that. It was hard for Radhaya to meet the affection and compassion in the eyes of Krishn. Krishn was very fond of him. Krishn too, was very dear to Radhaya. But for the affection he had for Duryodhan, he could have said that he was most fond of Krishna. Krishna knew it and was happy about it. He had shown that he was flattered by Radhaya's affection for him. The night passed slowly. But Radhaya was awake all night. He was glad to have had time to take up each moment of his past life in his hands and look at it before dropping it into the bowl of forgetfulness. So passed the last night of Radhaya, a night haunted by the past. 4. Salia the Charioteer of Radhaya The seventeenth day of the Great War dawned. Early in the morning Duryodhan went to Salia and said, I have come to you with a request. I now fall at your feet and ask you to grant it to me. I want you to do me a great favor. Today Radhaya is to meet Arjun in the battle. He can easily win if he has a charioteer like Krishna. I ask you most humbly to be the charioteer to my dearest friend Radhaya. 
There is no one else who is good enough to hold the reins of Radhaya's horses. You are the one person who can do it. You must see me through this crisis. Radhaya is far superior to Arjun. But because of this handicap, he is not able to kill him. Look at my army now. It was so huge, and it has now dwindled down in size like a river during summer months. I had so many great heroes fighting for me. Most of them are dead, they died so that I may live. I do not know how I will escape the sin of killing so many of them. But all that is not a thing to worry us now. In this army only a few are left. You are the greatest of them all. You are the one person who can help me to win the war. Radhaya is sure to kill Arjun, with you as his charioteer. You are as much interested in my welfare as Radhaya is. You must help me. Radhaya is invincible even by the gods, why then should I worry about this mortal man, Arjun? Please agree to my proposal. Salia was wild with Duryodhan. He said, Duryodhan, you are insulting me. You have no right to ask this of me. In your affection for Radhaya, you are praising him too much. You are making him out to be greater than he really is. Your loving eyes are magnifying his greatness. You are trying to make me, a Kshatriya, do the work of a Sutputra to a Sutputra. What has come over you, Duryodhan? Are you not trying to make me do the impossible? Suttas are just attendants at the court of a king. They are meant to hold the whip in their hands and drive the chariots of kings. I am a great king. I have been given the coronation bath. I wear a crown. I am a Maharadika. I have fought in many great battles and I have never been vanquished. Now you ask me to do menial service to an inferior, to a Sutputra. How can a Kshatriya, who is an anointed king, be a charioteer to a low-born man? You talk as though Radhaya is superior to me. He is not equal to me. I can kill that man easily. You are trying to do this to me. Deliberately. Look at this bow of mine and look at these arrows. Look at my chariot and my beautiful horses. I can fight with Indra and defeat him in single combat. You have today insulted a great warrior. I can fight with Radhaya and Arjun and Krishna all together and win. I am not pleased with you and your words. You have insulted me. I will go back to my kingdom. You do not deserve the affection I had for you. Salia tried to walk out of the assembly. Duryodhan waylaid him and stood in front of him with folded palms and with tears in his eyes. He said, My lord, it is not right that you should be angry with me. I have not tried to insult you, nor have I tried to make out that Radhaya is better than you. I know all about you and your greatness. In a single fight Radhaya will not be able to bear your fury. I know that you have been given the name Salia since you are like a sharp arrow lodged in the heart of your enemy. I am trying to tell you the real reason for this request of mine. I know that Radhaya is superior to Arjun. But he must also have a charioteer who is superior to the charioteer of Arjun. In this entire world you are the one person who is far superior to Krishna. Hence I am asking you to hold the reins of Radhaya's horses as Brahma did for Shankar. When he killed the Tripuras. Actually, my lord, you are twice as good as Krishna. You must do this for me and Radhaya. Salia heard the words of Duryodhan. He said, Duryodhan, you have today said in the midst of all these heroes that I am superior to Krishna. I am pleased with your remark. I will become the charioteer of Radhaya. Since you consider me to be the only person to do so, I will do it. I promise to you in the presence of all these people that I will drive the chariot of Radhaya. Duryodhan fell at his feet in gratitude and went to his dear Radhaya to tell him about the good fortune that had befallen them. Duryodhan came back to Salia and said, I want to tell you something else. The great Bhargav obtained all the divine astras he had from Lord Shankar. The Lord had told him that the astras were not to be given to any low-born man. Bhargav agreed. 
He had Radhaya as his disciple. He has given all the astras and his own bow called Vijay to Radhaya. He is a great man, my lord. He has the gift of inner sight. He must be knowing that Radhaya is not a low-born soot. Radhaya must have deserved his gifts, or else he would not have given them to him. For a long time I have felt that Radhaya is not a Sutputra. He is the son of a high-born Kshatriya woman. He is the adopted son of Atiruth. I have no doubt about his being the son of some god. He has got to be a Kshatriya. He has been abandoned by his mother at birth, perhaps because of some indiscretion. This hero, glowing like the sun, cannot be a Sutputra. No deer can give birth to a leopard cub. Have you noticed his wide shoulders and his long beautiful arms? They cannot belong to a Sutputra who drives a cart. I know that he is a Kshatriya born to some high-born woman and a god. His birth has the cloak of obscurity thrown over it. But his caste shines forth like the sun through the darkest cloud. Someday, this riddle will be solved, and I will be the person to show the world that he is a Kshatriya. Radhaya is born to rule the world. You have got to see it. It is so obvious. My guess cannot be wrong. I know the greatness of Radhaya. Else, how can he be superior to Arjun the Great? Archer? There is nothing shameful in being his charioteer. He is a Kshatriya. Salia embraced Duryodhan and said, I am very fond of you, and I will please you as best as I can. But I have something to say. I may use sharp words in my love for you. I may be sharp with Radhaya. You and Radhaya must not mind the sharpness of my tongue. I hate for qualities in man, insulting oneself because of inferiority complex, praising one's own qualities, decrying others, bravado. If I find any of these in Radhaya, I will censure him. He must not mind it. Radhaya came in just in time to hear this. He said with a smiling face, I am greatly honored by your kindness. I am proud to feel that the great Salia is to be my charioteer. I thank you most humbly for this favor. Salia was very pleased by the humble words of Radhaya. Salia went and prepared the great chariot of Radhaya. He brought it to the presence of Radhaya. The chariot was Radhaya's most precious possession. He made a Pradakshina to it and saluted it. He saluted the son, his father. He made Salia enter the chariot first and followed him into it. It was a splendid sight. Radhaya and Salia were glowing like the sun and fire. They advanced towards the army of the Pandavas. He looked like the sun in his chariot driven by the glowing Aruna. Duryodhan was there. He spoke parting words to Radhaya. He said, what was not possible for Bhishma and Drona will today be achieved by you, Radhaya. I know that today is the most wonderful day in your life and mine. Go, my friend, and come back covered with eternal glory. Radhaya said, I will certainly try my best. I am taking leave of you. Remember that Radhaya, your Radhaya, spared no pains for your success. The rest is in the hands of fate. You must always remember that, Duryodhan. The friends parted with just a ring of the hands. Radhaya was moving away from Duryodhan. He had begun his last journey. The tears in his eyes showed that he was conscious of it, that it was his last journey, and that it was the last meeting with his friend Duryodhan. 5. Yudhishthir hurt by Radhaya. Radhaya said, Salia, take me to the presence of the Pandavas. I am going to defeat all of them. I am sure to kill Arjun and win the war. Salia remembered his promise to Yudhishthir. He had to damp the enthusiasm of Radhaya as much as he could. He spoke words in praise of Arjun and the Pandavas. He said, Why do you have such a high ambition? How dare you insult the greatness of the Pandavas? You will talk like this until you hear the twang of the Gandiv. You will talk like this until you see Beam destroying the elephant army. You will talk like this until you see Yudhishthir and his brothers with their sharp and stinging arrows. Then you will talk no more. I know the power of the Pandavas. 
You do not. Radhaya said, I do not want to displease you by contradicting you. Let us proceed, my lord. The chariot was well on its way. Radhaya was well versed in the art of reading meanings in the omens, and he saw that he was seeing omens unfavorable to him. He knew that nothing boded a pleasing future for him. He was past all caring. With a disdainful shrug of his shoulders he went on. His smile was tinged with bitterness. All the way to the front Salia continued his praise of the Pandavs. He praised Arjun and he decried Radhaya. It was wounding to Radhaya. He said, Your name fits you. Your words are terrible. They go right into my heart and hurt. They hurt abominably. I do not know why you are doing this to me. But I do not care. I will do my duty today. I know that there is such a thing as fate which watches over the lives of men. It is awake when all the world is asleep. It works in a strange manner. When I saw that Drona was killed, and when I saw Bisham fall, I knew that man is powerless in the hands of fate. But the future of man is, to a certain extent, in his own hands. If death on the field is the ultimate fate of a man, still he can make a name for himself by fighting as well as he can. He can die in such a manner that he can make up for the wrongs of fate. I know that I have no chance against Arjun. I have known it for the last so many years. I will fight for my king who has given me his heart, and I will please him by giving up my life for him. Please help me to perform this sacrifice for him. I am already a doomed man. Do not hurt the last few hours of my life with your words in praise of Arjun. If your idea is to damp my enthusiasm, you are doing an excellent job of it. You have succeeded in your plan. Please do not speak any more. Salia was silent after this. The army was arrayed wonderfully by Radhaya. Yudhishthir and Arjun arranged their army in a counter via. Yudhishthir said, Arjun, you must meet Radhaya today. Bhim will kill Duryodhan. Let us all meet them individually. Nakul will fight with the sons of Radhaya, Sahdev with Shakuni. Sadanika will meet Dasashun, and Satyaki will meet his cousin Kritvarma. Drishtadhom can take Ashvatthama, and I will fight with Kripa. The fight began in a two moments. The remnants of the Trigarda army rushed against Arjun. As was his custom, Arjun advanced single-handed. He had never taken an army with him. He had defeated the great Kalakayas and the Nivadakovach single-handed. He was able to work wonders all by himself. The noise made by the army was deafening. The clash of sword against sword, the whiz of the incessant arrows, the clash of mace against mace, the shrieks of horses and elephants as they fell down wounded, the beating of the war drums and the blaring of the trumpets, all these together made the battlefield a veritable home of noises. Radhaya was determined to fight his best today and die on the battlefield. He was like Bhishma on the ninth day of the war. He killed each and every one of those who came within the range of his arrows. The arrows were just singing past all the time. It was not possible for anyone to meet him. Many of the Punchal heroes were killed even at the beginning of the battle. Radhaya's chariot wheels were protected by his sons. Sushana and Satyasena were near the wheels and Vrishasana was protecting his father from behind. It was a formidable team. The Pandav host was trying its best to fight with Radhaya. Drishtadhom, Satyaki, the sons of Drupadi, Bhim, Shikhandi, Nakul and Satyav were all stationed against the chariot of Radhaya. Not one of them could stop the progress of his chariot. Bhim was able to kill Satyasena, the son of Radhaya. The other two were wounded. But Vrishasana came back in another chariot and continued to guard the chariot of his father from behind. The Pandav army was melting. Like snow at the touch of the sun. All the warriors were defeated. They had to abandon the presence of Radhaya, who was as terrible as the god of death. Yudhishthir advanced towards the chariot of Radhaya. He was bent on fighting a duel with him. With his eyes red with anger, 
the noble Yudhishthir said, Listen to me, you low-born man. You are a suit putra, and for the last so many years you have been trying to vie with my Arjun. You have sworn to kill him. You have been fond of the king Duryodhan, who is a low man though born of a high and noble family. Let me see your prowess. I want to see this valor of yours, depending on which my cousin has begun this war. Come, fight with me and show me how powerful you are. I will save Arjun the bother of killing you. Radheya smiled and said, So be it. He looked at Yudhishthir for a long time. He roused himself from the reverie and said, Yudhishthir, you are a great man. You are a great fighter too. I am happy to greet you as one hero does another. I am happy to have been given a chance to meet you and spend some time with you. You may not believe it, but I am pleased to be with you for a while. He smiled his sweetest smile and began to fight with Yudhishthir. It was a great duel. Radheya was hurt in the beginning by the arrows of his brother. He sat down on the terrace of his chariot unable to bear the pain. He fainted away. He roused himself and continued to fight. Satyaki and the others came to help Yudhishthir, but Radheya was unmoved. He rooted all of them and was left fighting with Yudhishthir. Again there was a repetition of the technique of Radheya. Yudhishthir's bow was broken. With a smile Radheya broke open the glowing armor of Yudhishthir, who now stood without his bow and without his armor. His body was covered by his blood. Radheya could not bear to see the blood of his younger brother. He hated himself for it. But it had to be done. The smile was still on Ms. lips. He saw a javelin thrown by Yudhishthir. With a low laugh Tai broke it into two. For more of them were broken too. Yudhishthir's banner was on the ground. Radheya had reduced him to the state of a helpless man who could be killed at a moment's notice. Yudhishthir glared with helpless fury at Radheya. Radheya laughed at him and his discomfiture. He touched Yudhishthir with the tip of his bow and said, Yudhishthir, you are born in a great family. You are the eldest Pandav. You are a Kshatriya and my poor self is just a Sutputra, as you aptly put it. You, a Kshatriya, are supposed to be good at killing your enemies. But my lord, your honored self is not fitted for the role you have taken up. You are a Brahmin by temperament. You are wrong as a Kshatriya. Please do not attempt to fight with those who are your superiors. Do not challenge anyone unless you are sure of defeating him. Go back to your home, my dear Yudhishthir, or go where your brother Arjun is fighting. You can never kill Radheya in single combat. Radheya turned away from Yudhishthir and left his presence. As if to punish himself, he began to attack the army with renewed vigor. Beam and the others tried to defend the army from the fury of Radheya. They could not. Radheya went to another part of the field. Beam followed him there. He was wild with anger against Radheya. He had hurled such insults at Yudhishthir. Looking at Beam who was advancing, Salia said, Radheya, look at Beam. He is angry with you. His face has never been so angry before. I have seen him after the death of Abhimanyu and that of his son Gadot Kutch. Even then he was not as angry as he is now. Today he looks like the god of death. I wonder why. Radheya said, you are right. Beam is angry. He is angry for his brother whom I have insulted just now. Do you not know that to the Pandavs the eldest brother is a god? The eldest Pandav can command the love and devotion of all the other Pandavs. They are prepared to die for him. I will fight with Beam. Beam advanced towards Radheya. They fought for a long time. In his fury, Beam was able to make Radheya faint. He wanted to cut the tongue of Radheya for the words he spoke to his brother. Salia was displeased with Beam. He said, Beam, do not be rash. Stop this. This is a wrong thing you are trying to do. Your brother was insulted by Radheya, and you have therefore fought with him, and you have defeated him. That is enough. You can go back from here. 
As for killing him, it is Arjun's work. He has sworn that he will kill Radhaya, and it is he who must try and see if he can keep his promise. You can go away from here. Bhim thought that the words of Salia were true. He left the presence of Radhaya and went away. After recovering from his faint, Radhaya wanted to fight again with Bhim. The king saw what he wanted to do and sent some of his brothers to help Radhaya. Bhim gave all his attention to them first. He killed so many of them. He had now lost count of the number of his victims. Radhaya and the others advanced towards Bhim, and the other heroes on the side of the Pandavs joined Bhim. The fight became general once again. The Trigardas had always been causing a lot of trouble to Arjun throughout the war. Whenever he wanted to fight with someone important, the Samsaptakas would challenge him and harass him for hours together. It was the same today. Arjun could not move away from them without destroying most of their army. He would kill some of them, and the next day some more of them would spring up from nowhere and challenge him. He had today been greatly harassed by Susanna, who was one of the few who had not been killed yet. He was good at using the divine astras, and Arjun had to fight for a long time with the Trigardas, and he destroyed more than half their army. He looked in other directions. He saw Radhaya. Arjun had been watching him. He saw that Radhaya had now fought with each one of the heroes on their side and had defeated each one of them. He mentally applauded the prowess of Radhaya. He spoke to Krishna about it. He wanted to be taken to the presence of Radhaya. Ashvatthama came to the presence of Arjun. He wanted to fight a duel with Arjun. Arjun had to agree. They began their duel. In a short time Ashvatthama covered the chariot of Arjun with his arrows. Nothing could be seen of Arjun or his chariot or the charioteer. Krishn was very angry with Arjun. He said, Still you have not got over your affection for your guru or his son. All that I have taught you so far has been just wasted. The foolish love you. Have for these two men is more than all my words. Your hands lose their quickness. Your fingers become numb when you see these men. Your Gandiv is asked to take some rest evidently, and you like to be harassed by Ashvatthama. I am displeased with you and your soft fighting at the wrong time. You have always been like this when your opponent is one of these. You forget your duty at the critical moment. Arjun could not bear the taunting words of Krishn. He fought with real anger. He removed the cloak of arrows which had covered them both. He fought furiously. He used several divine astras and was able to defeat Ashvatthama. The horses of Ashvatthama bolted, carrying him away from the battlefield. 6. In Yudhishthir's Tent Arjun turned his attention to the other heroes on the side of Duryodhan. The king of Magad and his brother were the next to fight with him. They were Dandadhara and Danda. He killed them both. He fought with the Samsaptakas once again. Krishna asked Arjun to hurry towards the chariot of Radhaya. He had to be killed that day. Arjun was in time to watch a fight between Ashvatthama and the king of the Pandyas. The Pandya king was very proud of his prowess. He did not like to be compared to anyone since he thought himself to be far superior to all the others. He was. He fought with Ashvatthama and was killed by him. It was a great loss to the Pandavs. Arjun saw that a great portion of his army had been destroyed by Radhaya. Ashvatthama was trying to kill his dear enemy Drishtadhum in a duel. Arjun joined in the general fight, and he was like a new lease of life for the depressed fighters. The enemy army was rooted and the Pandavs advanced further towards the army of Duryodhan. Krishna saw the chariot of Radhaya moving about the field as fast as the wind. Radhaya was dancing on the field, so graceful was his progress. Krishna watched him and said, It is a pleasure to watch Radhaya. Look at the graceful manner in which he draws the bow and shoots the arrows. His chest is indeed broad and beautiful. Look at the battlefield. It is strewn with bodies of soldiers and every one of them is wearing an arrow marked Radhaya. 
It is time you and he met. He has come to the end of his days on the earth. This great man has to die at your hands, Arjun. Let us hurry. Let us try and meet him as soon as we can. The several duels that were fought were all indefinite in their results. In some cases the Pandavs were fortunate, and in others the Kauravs. Radheya and Yudhishthir met again in single combat. Radheya was able to defeat him and wound him. It was so terrible that Yudhishthir could not even stand up. He went to his tent and lay down on his bed, unable to stand the pain caused by the arrows of Radheya. He had been hurt by his words already. Yudhishthir was very depressed. Every day he was getting more and more dissatisfied with the way things were progressing. He did not want this war at all. But now that the war was being fought, he did not like this drawn-out agony. He wished that Arjun would fight more intensely than he was doing so far. No, he was not pleased with the way Arjun was fighting. Arjun had said that he would kill all the enemies single-handed. He had done nothing about it so far. He was killing the ordinary soldiers as his grandfather was doing. But he had done nothing about the killing of Radheya, who was the main source of danger. He was allowing Radheya to dance about the field, and was doing nothing about keeping up his oath, that he would kill Radheya. Radheya had today said that Yudhishthir was fit to be a Brahmin and not a Kshatriya. But Yudhishthir was feeling that the description fitted Arjun better now. He was so soft in his fighting that it looked as though he did not want to fight at all. Only Beam was hearty about the whole thing. Nakul and Sukhdev were doing their best. But it came to this, the army on either side was dwindling. Nothing was being done about the killing of the main actors. Drishtadhum was the one person who had stuck to his oath, and Arjun was angry with him for that. Thoughts like these were crowding in the mind of Yudhishthir. Arjun was proceeding towards Radheya, who was becoming a terror to his army. Arjun missed Yudhishthir there. He heard from Bhim that he had gone to his tent because of the wounds inflicted by Radheya. At once Arjun said, Krishn, I must see my brother at once. After I have comforted him I will come and kill Radheya. He asked Bhim to stay and ward off the enemy attack, and went to the tent where Yudhishthir was resting. Krishn and Arjun entered the tent. They saw Yudhishthir there, alone and in the depths of depression. He saw Krishn and Arjun come towards him. He got up from his bed and welcomed them. When he saw them coming to him in the middle of the fight, Yudhishthir thought that Radheya had been killed and that they had come to give him the happy news. He said, after all he has been killed. Radheya has been haunting my sleep for the last so many years. He has been killed and I am so happy. Tell me, Arjun, how did you fight with him? How did his death happen and with what Astra did you kill him? Tell me everything in detail. Arjun said, My lord, I have not been able to meet him yet. I have been prevented by several of the Korov heroes from this encounter with Radheya. Having defeated the terrible Samsaptakus, I was going towards Radheya. Beam was holding the brothers of the king at bay, and I did not see you there. I was told that you have been wounded, and that you are resting. I became concerned about you and your welfare. So, here I am. I am going now to kill Radheya. Please bless me and send me. Yudhishthir was greatly disappointed at the news that Radheya was still alive. He lost his temper. He swore at Arjun. He used very harsh words. He insulted Arjun by saying, Give me the Gandhiv which is just an ornament in your hand. I will go and kill Radheya. Arjun was furious. Krishna intervened and said, Arjun, can you not see that Yudhishthir has been wounded by Radheya, and the suffering has made him impatient? He wants to rouse you into action. That is the reason why he is so harsh in his language. Yudhishthir had now cooled down, and he spoke gently to Arjun. He embraced Arjun and Krishna and said, I send you forth with my blessings. I know that you will come back victorious. There was hope in his voice. He felt that the death of Radheya was imminent. 
Krishna and Arjun had their horses refreshed and set out again to the front. The two were talking together as they proceeded. Krishna said, Arjun, you have sworn that you will kill Radhaya. You can do it. But remember he is not an easy opponent. He is the greatest archer on this earth. Even as you did during the days of the Rajsi of Yudhishthir, Radhaya has also defeated all the kings of Bharatvarsh. He has defeated the king of Kasi single-handed when he won a bride for the king. He has defeated Jarasand whom I could not face. Radhaya is your equal, in fact he is your better. He is glowing like Agni. He is like Vayu in his speed. He is like Indra in his anger. This handsome Radhaya is a very proud and sensitive man. He is the most powerful person on the side of Duryodhan. He is devoted to Duryodhan. Radhaya is a good man. He has performed innumerable good actions and he is famed as the greatest giver in this world. Arjun, you will have the good fortune of killing the great Radhaya. Arjun said, Krishna, I have you with me. You are leading me to victory. All I have to do is to listen to you. I will kill Radhaya with your blessings. They went towards the Korov army and joined in the general fight. Bhim had been busy with the destruction of the army. Everyone fled at his coming. He was like the wild north wind when it sweeps across the earth in fury. He was terrible. He wanted to kill as many of the brothers of Duryodhan as he possibly could. He looked for them in that army as a gleaner looks for stray grains of corn in a field which had been mowed down by a sickle. He was careering on the field, uttering shouts like a hungry lion. He heard the twang of the Gandiv in the midst of his celebration. He knew that Yudhishthir was well now the two of them, Arjun and himself, could work havoc in the army. Nakul was there and Sahdev. He enjoyed the company of Arjun while fighting. Arjun was coming straight towards Bhim. He had been worried about him since he had been caught in the thick of the enemy army when he last saw him. Duryodhan sent Shakuni to fight with Bhim. He was sent back defeated. Radhaya came to the rescue of his army. At a touch the entire face of the front changed. No one could fight Radhaya. Today he was like the burning of a thousand torches at the same time. He was like someone divine. Beam and the rest of them were not able to bear his arrows tipped with liquid fire. 7. The Death of Dasashun Arjun asked Krishna to take him to Radhaya. He said, Krishna, Salya is holding the reins of his horses even as you are holding those of mine. He looks splendid with the reins in his hands. Radhaya is magnificent. I have got to meet Radhaya. Take me to him soon. So be it, said Krishna and set his horses in Radhaya's path. Salya saw the chariot of Arjun coming towards them with grim determination. It is to be noticed here that Salya had stopped taunting Radhaya. He was overcome with sheer admiration for this great man who had set his life at stake and was fighting for his king Duryodhan. His promise to Yudhishthir was forgotten. He saw the greatness of Radhaya, and the warrior in him admired Radhaya. He said, Radhaya, the time has come when you shall fulfill your oath that you will kill Arjun. He is cutting up the army, and it looks like so much straw caught in a sickle. He is heading straight for you. Radhaya, you are the one person in the world who can face Arjun. I know of no one else who is as great as you. You will stop this man as the land does the rushing tide. He has no protectors. You are able to kill Arjun and Krishn. I know it. Bhishma, Drona, Kripa and Ashvatthama are far inferior to you in prowess. I am very proud to be the charioteer to such a great hero. Our army has scattered in all the four directions on seeing Arjun. Radhaya, you have so much power in your arms. You are well versed in the art of fighting. I remember that you won this earth for your friend Duryodhan once. You can do it again now by killing Arjun. Radhaya's eyes were blind with tears of gratitude for the words spoken by Salya. He said, 
My Lord, you have today made me the happiest person on this earth by your words of praise. I feel greatly honored. I will try and live up to your expectations. I know the greatness of Arjun. Still, I am hoping to kill him today and please my Lord, Master and friend, take me to him. I cannot wait. The two chariots were proceeding towards each other. Duryodhan was all the time watching Radhaya. He wanted to help him. He sent some of his brothers and others to help Radhaya. The progress of the two chariots was again impeded by a general fight. Bhim had again come to the forefront, and it was hard to stop his advance. Satyaki had killed Sushana, another son of Radhaya. Radhaya killed the son of Drishtadhum, and now the Punchals were attacking him altogether. Shikhandi, Janamjaya, Yadhamenyu, Uttamauja, and Drishtadhum were the five warriors who were fighting with Radhaya. He was able to defeat all of them. He made them retreat. They were joined by Satyaki and other Panchal warriors. The fight became general once again, to the great exasperation of Radhaya and Arjun. They were impatient to meet, and they could not. During the general fight Duryodhan with several of his brothers came to join in the fight. Dasashun was in the front. Bhim and Dasashun met. They fought a terrible duel. Each covered the other with arrows. Dasashun was a powerful fighter and he hated Bhim. These two factors made him fight his best today. He withstood the onslaught of Bhim. Bhim said, Come, Dasashun. I have been waiting for this duel for the last so many years. Dasashan smiled at him arrogantly and said, I have always wanted to see you fight. I am just as happy about this duel as you are, Beam. Beam said, I am glad you came to me today. I can today clear a debt I owed you for a very long time. I remember the time when you touched the perfumed hair of my Dhrupadi with your sinful hands. Ever since then, my... Dear cousin, I have always been thinking of you, and only you. You might have forgotten it. But I have not. Dasashan sneered at him. In an insolent voice he said, Why should I forget? I remember it very well. I remember so many other things when you speak of Drupadi. I remember your running away from the house of Lak to save your lives. I am remembering the time you spent in the forest like animals. I seem to remember your taking for wife a monster called Hidimbi. I remember the city of the Punchals where Arjun won that woman for wife. I remember that all of you wanted her, and she agreed to play wife to more than one man, even as your mother did. I remember her as she stood in our court, a slave, thanks to our uncle Shakuni. They were fighting all the time. The fight was very fierce. Dasashun was an excellent archer, and the javelin, which was thrown at him by Beam, was broken into two by the arrows of Dasashun. He was annoying Beam by breaking his bow. Beam was furious. He took up his mace, and with one fell blow he killed the horses of Dasashun. He made Dasashun fall down from his chariot by a powerful blow from his mace. Dasashun was on the ground. Beam looked at everyone around him and scanned them all one by one. He looked terrible. As he stood there rolling his eyes. They were copper red with anger. No one spoke, no one breathed. Beam locked at Duryodhan standing near and said, Yes, it is when you are looking on that I should do it. He looked at all of them, Kripa, Ashvatthama, Radhaya and Duryodhan. He laughed a cruel laugh. Bim rushed towards the unfortunate Dasashun and caught him in his hands. He caught him by the neck as a lion catches an elephant. He said, Dasashun, so you remember everything. Then how is it you do not remember the one thing which you ought to have remembered? I am going to drink the blood from your heart. Let me see who is able to stop me and save you. Bim turned to the people around him and said, Duryodhan, Eighteen days back you sent me a message through this jackal by name Uluk. You said, Beam, you swore that you would drink the blood of Dasashun. Drink it if you can. You may be able to carve meat for eating. But let me see how well you are going to carve my brother's heart. This was the message you sent me. 
I am giving the reply now. Watch me carve the heart of your brother. See me drink his blood. You were told that you will see your brother's helpless eyes, and that you will be able to do nothing about it. Look, Duryodhan, I have your brother by his neck now. Look at him like a sparrow in the grip of a hawk. You can see his eyes. They are asking you all to save him. Come and try if you can. It was the most terrible sight. No one could move. Everyone was paralyzed. Beam threw Dasashan on the bare ground. He placed his foot on his neck. He cut the right arm of Dasashan from his body and threw it on the ground. He said, Now the oath of Drupadi is fulfilled. She wanted to see this jeweled hand to fall on the ground, the hand which had dared to touch her hair. Beam ripped open the chest of Dasashun. He cut it with a swift stroke of his sword. Blood spurted out and Beam put his lips to the wound as the blood rushed out warm from the form of the dying man. Dasashun was not dead yet. It was terrible to see Beam drinking human blood and saying, This is the most tasty of all the drinks I have tasted so far. With the blood ebbed out the life of Dasashun. Radheya could not bear to see this dreadful scene. He could do nothing to help his friend. Salia saw the grief of Radheya. He said, You are too sensitive, Radheya. War means all these things. Now that Dasashun is dead, the king has only you to help him. Do not lose heart at the sight of this outrage. Duryodhan is plunged in grief. The fate and happiness of the king is all in your hands. Do not lose heart. Let us proceed to the spot where Arjun is. I am taking you away from here. Salia took the chariot of Radheya away from the presence of Bhim. Vrishasana, the son of Radheya, was advancing towards the army of the Pandavas. He went straight at Bhim. He was indeed the son of Radheya. He had the same grace and power for which Radheya was famed the world over. He was harassing the Pandavas. Arjun saw this. He came to fight with Vrishasana. Arjun had sworn that he would kill the son of Radheya when he was looking on. After fighting with him for a while, Arjun killed Vrishasana with a sharp arrow. Radheya had to see his son killed. He had just seen the killing of Dasashun. Before he could get over the shock of it he had to see the death of his child. His eyes were full of tears which flowed like an endless stream. Anger gave place to sorrow. Radheya was eager to fight with Arjun. He asked Salia to proceed fast towards Arjun. 8. Radheya and Arjun Radheya's chariot had come to the front. He stood just in front of Arjun. The two great fighters, the greatest archers in the world, faced each other, bent on killing each other. Radheya challenged Arjun to a single combat. Just before the fight began, Radheya turned his smiling face to Salia and said, I am hoping to win today. If however I am killed, what will you do, my lord? Salia's eyes were moist. He said, I am sure you will win. If however you should die, Radheya, I will kill the two of them and avenge your death. Radheya was very happy to hear the words of Salia. Strange to say, Arjun asked the same question of Krishn. Krishn smiled and said, The sun may drop down from the heavens, but you will not fail. The fire may lose its heat, but you will not fail. If however you are killed by Radheya, then you may be sure that the end of the world has come. I will kill Salia and Radheya with my bare hands. I will destroy the world with my anger. But that will not happen. I know it. The two charioteers glared at each other and the two fighters smiled at each other. They were ready for the fight. Ashvatthama saw them preparing themselves for the fight. His heart was suddenly full of compassion for everyone on the battlefield. He took the hand of Duryodhan and squeezed it. The king was still heaving with the sobs caused by the death of his beloved brother Dasashun. Ashvatthama said, Duryodhan, Look at these two heroes getting ready to kill each other. Stop this war. Make peace with the Pandavas. They are good men. 
My father is dead. Bishm has fallen. In a short while Radhaya may be dead. I will ask Arjun to stop it. He will listen to my words. Krishna will welcome the suggestion of peace. I cannot be killed and my uncle cannot be killed. Still, you may lose the war. Yudhishthir has always hated the thoughts of war. Beam. Nakul and Sukhdev will listen to their brother. This slaughter has gone on long enough. Stop it. Let Radhaya and Arjun live as friends. I ask you very humbly to make all hostilities cease. If you do not, I can assure you, you will be plunged in grief. Make them all your friends. Nothing will be more wonderful. Save your soul before it is too late. You know that I am not as fond of anyone else as I am of you. I want you to live, my dear friend. That is why I am asking you to do this. I am sure that Radhaya will be killed in today's fight. I want to spare you that grief. That is why I am asking you to stop this war. Look at the destruction caused to both the armies during these 17 days. You must ponder well and stop this war. Duryodhan looked at his friend and stood silent for a few moments. Then he said, All that you are saying is true, Ashvatthama. I know it only too well. But it is too late. After seeing my beloved Dasashan killed like that, I cannot think of anything else but war. We have gone too far, there is no return for us. It is no use thinking of the impossible. Things have been destined to follow a certain pattern. It will all happen just that way. Radhaya is right. There is no armor against fate. I must go on. I cannot stop. I thank you, my friend, for your affection. But it cannot be done. This war must go on to the last man. Duryodhan made arrangements for an army to surround Radhaya. Arjun had the entire Pandav army around him. They all wanted to watch while the great duel was being fought between the two great heroes of Bharatvarsh. The duel had begun. Radhaya and Arjun were fighting with just ordinary arrows and javelins and the like. They had not warmed up yet. It was just the beginning stage of a duel. It was more a display of the skill of both. The arrows of Arjun were cut up by Radhaya when they were in the act reaching him. The same skill was displayed by Arjun also. The tone of the duel changed in a moment. Arjun suddenly decided to use divine astras. He sent Agni Astra. Radhaya braced himself up and smilingly sent the Varan Astra, the counter Astra. The fire caused by Arjun's Astra was quenched by that of the proud Radhaya. The sky was now covered by dense black clouds and a cool breeze blew. The clouds were dispelled by the Vayavistra sent by Arjun. Still, it was just display. There was darkness one moment because of the Varanastra, and it was dispelled by Arjun. Now Arjun sent the Astra called Indra. It began to shower arrows on the entire army of the Kauravs. Radhaya was furious with Arjun. He took up an arrow and spoke the incantations for a great Astra. It was the powerful Bhargavstra the gift of his Guru Bhargav. This Astra was terrible. It destroyed all the arrows sent by Arjun. The entire army was amazed at the greatness of Radhaya. The army on both the sides suffered as a result of these Astras. The Bhargavstra was more powerful than the Indra. The Pandav army was being harassed by it. The Kauravs were happy. Bhim was very angry with Arjun. He said, Radhaya is covering you with his arrows. The enemies are laughing at your condition, and you are doing nothing about it. If you cannot, just tell me, and I will kill Radhaya with just one hit of my mace. His time is ripe. He will have to die, and I will do your work for you. Krishna heard the words of Bhim and said, Arjun, it looks as though the words of Bhim are true. It looks as though we will never be able to emerge out of the veil of arrows which Radhaya has placed around us. Arjun, why do you hesitate? Krishna spoke to Arjun as Narayan to Nar. He said, 
Did you not kill Dambadbava when he challenged you? Radhaya is Dambadbava. You must use all your astras against this man who is a past master in the art of fighting. Send the Brahmastra. You must remember who you are. You must remember the purpose for which you have been born on this earth. Rouse your sleeping self and do the needful. Arjun remembered his previous birth. He invoked the Brahmastra after saluting it in his mind. The four quarters were covered by the arrows from this astra. Arjun and Krishna merged out of the cloud that had been covering them up till now. Radhaya was sending a stream of arrows. It looked as though he did not need any astra to cause a continuous stream. Arjun was not able to bear the power of the arrows of Radhaya. But he managed to recover himself. He had covered the chariot of Radhaya with his arrows. For a while the Kauravs thought that Radhaya had been killed. There was loud lamentation. But Radhaya came out of it easily. The two heroes were equally matched. They sent against each other all the astras they knew. Yudhishthir heard that the great duel was being fought between Arjun and Radhaya. With difficulty he got up and came there to watch the duel. The sky was filled up with all the devas who had come to watch the fight. Indra and Surya were very nearly on the point of fighting a duel on behalf of their sons. Bhim was also being hurt by the occasional arrows of Radhaya. The entire army on either side was suffering from the arrows of both of them. Both the bows, Vijay and Gandiv, were making music. There was no other noise there on the field except the twanging of the strings of these bows. There were often shouts and cheers, now from the Kauravs and now from the Pandavs, when something graceful was performed by either of the two. Radhaya cut the string of Arjun's bow. Arjun replaced it with great speed. With a smile Radhaya cut that also. Again it was replaced. This happened eleven times. Arjun was replacing the strings so quickly and so skillfully that Radhaya was lost in admiration. He praised Arjun in his mind. He was proud of this younger brother of his. He loved him so much when he fought so well. Radhaya was covered again by the arrows of Arjun. Looking as angry as Rudra at the end of the world, Radhaya began to harass Arjun. He had with him five deadly snake-like arrows. These he sent towards Krishan. Arjun was furious. The anger of both was rising. The time had passed when they could afford to be gentle. It was a fight to death between them now. 9. The Death of Radhaya Arjun sent arrows which burned Radhaya. The arrows were aimed at the army which surrounded Radhaya. The protectors of the wheels of Radhaya's chariot fled in sheer terror. Arjun continued to hurt all those who surrounded Radhaya. They all fled away, leaving him alone on the field. Duryodhan was very angry with these deserters. He tried his best to make them go back to the front. But no one was able to face Arjun and his terrible arrows. Radhaya cut away the arrows which were trying to cover him up. He now decided to send a single astra which was sure to kill Arjun. Radhaya took up the terrible Nagastra. It was now his most precious possession. For a moment he thought of the Sakti which had been with him all these years. If only he had not been forced to part with it. He could have killed Arjun, and now it had gone back to Indra. Radhaya had no time to think. He had no time for regrets, no time to think of the might have beens. He had nothing except the Nagastra. He was sure of its killing Arjun. He took it out of its perfumed case and took sure aim at the neck of Arjun. He planned to cut his head. Salia saw this and said, Radhaya, do not aim at his neck. Aim at his chest, or at least send another arrow, a companion, aimed at his chest. This may fail. Radhaya said, Radhaya will never change the aim once it has been taken. It is not befitting a good archer to send a companion arrow thinking that the first will fail. It is against the etiquette of fighting to change the aim after one has decided. Radhaya drew the string to the fullest. He fixed the arrow to it. 
The sky glowed with the brilliance of the Astra. Radhaya said, Arjun, take a good look at the world before you die. This is your last moment on the earth. The Astra had left his bow. It coursed along the air like a streak of lightning, spitting fire as it approached Arjun. The army was watching with bated breath. The Pandavs were sure of the death of Arjun. Then happened something which baffled the plans of Radhaya. Krishan pressed hard on the horses. They knelt down on the ground making the chariot sink into the ground to a depth of five inches. Since the chariot had been pushed far into the ground, the Astra could not touch the neck of Arjun. It hit against the beautiful crown he was wearing and felled it to the ground. It was the crown which had been placed on his head by Indra. It had been made specially for him by the divine craftsman, and it was fretted with a thousand gems. It was the crown which had earned for him the name Purity. It fell down on the ground hit by the Nagastra. A great sigh, which seemed to shatter his frame, escaped Radhaya. He knew now that he had nothing that would hurt Arjun. This was the one thing that should have killed him. It had failed because of the astuteness of Krishna. It was all over, his dream of killing Arjun and Duryodhan's dream of ruling the world. It was all just a mirage. Tears of anger and disappointment blinded Radhaya. He brushed them away impatiently and began to fight as before. Arjun bound up his beautiful curly hair with a white kerchief and resumed fighting. Yudhishthir was still gasping with relief. It was a close thing. He had almost lost Arjun. But Krishn was there, Krishn who had said that the Pandavs meant his very life to him. Radhaya saw a vicious snake emerging from the spot where the crown had fallen. The snake came to Radhaya and said, Your astra failed to cut the neck of Arjun since I had entered it without your knowledge. Now look at me and send the astra again at him. I will certainly kill him. Arjun is an old enemy of mine. My name is Aswazna. During the burning of the Kandav forest my mother was killed by him, and I have been nursing this grievance against him all these years. Please send me again. You are the one man who is capable of killing Arjun. Let me help you in your attempt. Help me to take my revenge on Arjun. Radhaya was very angry with the snake. He said, Listen to me, you interfering fool. Radhaya is not so helpless that he has to get the help of others to fight with his enemy. I depend on myself and on no one else. I would rather be killed a hundred times than depend on the strength of others. I will kill Arjun with my strength and not with borrowed strength. You have done me wrong by entering without my permission. You can go away from here before I kill you. Aswazna was wild because his attempts at revenge had come to nothing. He decided to attack Arjun all by himself. The snake sped across the air with the intention of killing Arjun. Krishna saw the snake coming in the direction of the chariot. Guessing its intentions, he said, Arjun. Quick! Kill this snake before it kills you. It is coming to kill you. Arjun said. Who is this that comes to destroy me without being sent by anyone? Krishna told him about its ancient hatred for Arjun. Arjun sent six sharp arrows which killed the snake even, as it was poised in the air ready to strike. The fight went on between Arjun and Radhaya. Both were cut up by the many arrows, and blood was flowing in rivulets along their mighty chests. Salia and Krishna were hurt too. But the fight went on. Radhaya's end was drawing near. Fate had decided that the moment had. Come. Unseen by anyone and unknown to anyone, fate was trying to make the curse of the Brahmin come true. The earth had to cooperate, and she became soft all on a sudden. One wheel of the chariot of Radhaya was slowly but surely getting caught up in the mire. It looked like the sun setting, like life ebbing out of a spent body. It was a slow process but it was very sure. The wheel had sunk far into the ground. The chariot tipped and the level was uneven. It was then that Radhaya noticed it. He went back several years. He saw the dead cow on the ground. He saw the Brahmin and his angry eyes. 
Again he heard the voice of the Brahmin. When you are fighting with your enemy, your heart's dearest enemy, the wheel of your chariot will get sunk in the ground. And just as you killed my poor innocent cow when it was unaware of the danger that threatened it, even so will you be killed by your opponent when you are least prepared for the attack. Radhaya wanted to make the most of the time given him. He fixed an arrow to his bowstring and invoked the Brahmastra. He could not remember the great Astra. It was now the end. His guru's words came back to him, when you are desperately in need of an Astra, your memory will fail you. Radhaya saw that he was now completely beaten. His wheel had sunk to the ground, the divine Astras were not at his command anymore, the Nagastra had proved futile. His Kovach and Kundalas had already been lost, his Sakti had gone. Tears of rage filled his eyes, rage against fate. Arjun was cutting the strings of his bow as quickly as he strung them. Radhaya wrung his hands in helpless fury and said, It has been said that. Righteousness is always there to protect those that are righteous. As far as I am concerned, I have practiced them to the best of my knowledge. But this therm is a wayward mistress who never rewards those who love her. There is nothing like therm in this world. Radhaya was being hurt by the sharp arrows of Arjun. But he had become quite indifferent to all these things. Arjun sent the great Indrastra against him. With very great effort of the will, Radhaya remembered the Brahmastra and sent it to baffle the Indra. His chariot had its left wheel completely sunk in the ground. The protectors of the wheels had been scared away long ago by the fury of Arjun. Radhaya had to descend from the chariot. Arjun fixed an arrow to his bow string, and he had planned to invoke the great Rudrastra. Radhaya's eyes filled with tears of wrath and helplessness. He said, Arjun, the left wheel of my chariot has sunk into the ground. It is just my fate and nothing else which has caused this to happen at this critical moment. If you will wait a moment, I will raise it. You are a great hero. You are a righteous fighter. Please stop your fighting until I am ready. It is not fair to fight when the opponent is not ready to fight back. I am sure you will follow the rules of fair fighting. You are there on the chariot, and I am here on the ground without weapons. It is not right that you should send your Astra now. Wait for a while. I will raise the wheel, and we will then fight. Krishna laughed cruelly at Radhaya. He said, So you want a fair treatment from Arjun now? Tell me truly, Radhaya, if you have walked always in the path of righteousness. You have been part of Duryodhan's plots against the Pandavas. You were there when their queen Drupadi was dragged to the court by Dasashun. You gloated over her helplessness more than the others. You never thought of righteousness when the game of dice was being played. Why talk of what happened long ago? Let me remind you of something which happened but for days back, yes, for days back. All of you killed Abhimanyu. Krishna's eyes were red. His face was terrible to look at. It was distorted with fury and sorrow at the thought of Abhimanyu. He said, yes. Abhimanyu. Six heroes murdered him. He wanted a fair chance. He did not have a single weapon. With the wheel of his chariot in his hand he called you all to fight with him one by one. Did you think of the rules of fighting then? Who cut the bow of Abhimanyu from behind, when he was unaware of it? Was it a hero who knew the rules of fair fighting? You disgust me with your demands for fair fighting. How dare you expect it when you did not pay any attention to it then? Krishan's lips were throbbing with rage. Krishan's words hurt Radhaya more than the arrows of Arjun. He knew it all to be true. He hung his head down and went on with his attempts to lift the chariot from the ground. It was almost like his attempts to live against all odds. Krishna knew all about him. He knew that the one wrong act he did in his life was loving the sinful Duryodhan. But he was paying the price for it with his heart's blood. Was that not enough? Why should Krishna wound him like that? It was all destined long ago that he had to be the only true friend of Duryodhan. Fate had decided his future, and it was no use trying to explain one's actions. He loved this man Duryodhan. 
he was prepared to do anything for him. He committed sin for his sake. He had never approved of the shady plans of Shakuni. He had even tried to prevent Duryodhan from taking the advice of Shakuni. But it was of no use. Radhaya never did have the heart to deny Duryodhan the happiness of his triumph over the Pandavs. Radhaya had been so hearty in the Sava on that memorable day. Since he wanted to please Duryodhan, Krishna knew it and yet he accused him of unrighteousness. But now there was no time to think. He could not unweave the web that had been woven once. He had been caught in it. It was now time to die, to lay down the arms and rest. He had paid the debt in full. Radhaya left the wheel of the chariot and went back to fight. Arjun did not send the Redrastra. He sent the Agneya, and it was baffled by Radhaya sending the Varanastra. Radhaya's body was weak with the effort he had to expend in remembering the incantations. That was the last Astra he could recall. He had to depend now on just his own skill to ward off the Astras of Arjun. Arjun was now sending the Vayavistra. In between the exchange of arrows, Radhaya would jump down from his chariot and try to lift it up. Again he would resume the fighting. It was a sight that should have made the gods weep. It was awful to see the great Radhaya in such a terrible condition. No one could help him. No one could come near him because of the arrows of Arjun. And again, everyone was too stunned by the horror of the situation to do anything. Salia could do nothing. He had to manage the horses which were ready to bolt at any moment, their bodies had been mangled so ruthlessly by Arjun. Radhaya sent a powerful arrow to kill Arjun. The impact was just terrible. It fell on Arjun's chest and he fainted. The Pandavs thought that he was dead. The Gandhiv slipped from his hand. It was a great moment for the Kauravs. They were sure that Arjun was killed. But before they could cheer Arjun recovered from the faint. His eyes took on a crimson hue. He felled the banner of Radhaya. The glittering banner fell on the ground looking like a fallen rainbow. With the fall of that banner fell all that was dear to Radhaya, his fame, his name. The heart of the Kauravs broke when they saw the proud banner of Radhaya lying on the ground, drenched in the blood of Radhaya. He tried once again to lift up his chariot. He could not. He gave up all hopes now. But still he was trying. He was on the ground with his two arms straining at the wheel. His veins were like whipcords. His face was wet with sweat and blood pouring down his temples. His eyes were raining tears of mortification. Krishn said, Arjun, you must hurry. You must kill Radhaya before he comes back to the chariot. Arjun took up an arrow which was like a thunderbolt. Looking at it, the Kauravs lost heart. Arjun invoked the divine Astra, and fixing the arrow to his bow he pulled the string to his ears. He released the arrow. The sky was illuminated by the splendid arrow as it sped on its way. Radhaya was bending down, his arms were still trying in vain to lift up the chariot. The arrow of Arjun came very near him. Radhaya just looked at it and even as he was looking at it with a smile of sheer contempt in his eyes, it cut the head of the great Radhaya. The head of the great commander of the Korov army fell on the ground like the sun suddenly descending to the earth. His handsome face still bore the smile. And his lower lip was caught between his teeth in his efforts to raise the chariot. A glow left the body of Radhaya and went upwards to the sky. There were some who could see this. The glow went slowly, so slowly that it looked as though it were unwilling to leave that beautiful body which had held it for so many years. 10. The King A Picture of Woe Radhaya was dead. There was nothing left on the earth after the death of Radhaya. All that was beautiful and noble died with Radhaya. It was the afternoon of the seventeenth day of the Great War. But looking at the fallen form of Radhaya everyone was sure that the sun had left the sky and descended to the earth to make it beautiful. The field looked beautiful because of the noble head of Radhaya, which was lying on the ground like a broken lotus blossom. There was a sudden darkness in the sky for a few moments. 
The sun, sunk in sorrow, stopped glowing in the sky for a few moments. He came out again but his rays were weak as at the end of day. Radhaya was glowing like molten gold. His broad chest, which had been hurt by the arrows of Arjun, looked wonderful to those who stood and looked at him. His lotus eyes were closed. His body was covered with the dust of the battlefield. The sun looked on him, and he was stricken with despair. Slowly and very unwillingly he illuminated the battlefield. It was midday. But the sun's rays were as soft as moonbeams, so great was his sorrow at the death of his unfortunate son. Salia drove the chariot without its banner and without its owner to the camp. He found that the dreadful chariot had come out of the mire of its own accord. It looked as though nothing had happened to it. Salia was not able to see because of the tears that welled up in his eyes. His ears were deafened by the roars in the Pandav army. He could not bear to hear the sound of conchs and trumpets which were blaring forth the victory of the Pandavs. Salia hurried to the presence of Duryodhan. The king was a picture of woe. His heart just broke when he saw the fall of the greatest of all men. He did not dream that Radhaya, his dear Radhaya, would die that day. He remembered the night before when Radhaya came to him again from the doorway of the tent and embraced him. He wept hot tears that scorched him like drops of liquid fire. Radhaya was dead and he was alive. He had not grasped the full truth. Slowly he realized that he was alive in a world which had no place for Radhaya. His Radhaya was dead. Dead. He beat his hands in futile fury. He was speechless with woe. Salia found him thus, with his eyes raining tears and his words coming out in gasps. He could not stand up. His knees gave way under him. Seeing Salia, his grief broke out anew. He saw the chariot of Radhaya and the empty seat. He saw the bow and quiver of Radhaya. Duryodhan broke down completely. Salia comforted him. His heart was heavy when he spoke to Duryodhan. He said, My child, do not break your heart. These things are all in the hands of fate. Having seen how Radhaya fought, I can only blame fate for killing him. There was never a duel like the one fought today. Radhaya was more than a match for Krishna and Arjun. But fate was too powerful. It was fate which killed Radhaya, Arjun was just the instrument. There is no use in trying to stop the course of destiny. Salia spoke in glowing terms of the valor of Radhaya. He said, he has now reached the heavens. Do not grieve for Radhaya. He is happy now. Recall the army. It is not in a condition to fight. They have all become numb with the shock of the fall of Radhaya. Even the sun shines but dimly today though it is not evening yet. Stop the war for the day. Duryodhan left it all to the others and sat sunk in woe. Ashvatthama and the others came to Duryodhan and tried to pacify him. But nothing could suit the wounded heart of Duryodhan. He sat where he was, all through the terrible night. Radhaya was alone on the battlefield. He was dead, but beauty had not left his noble face. His body was glowing as though there was still life in it. People were still afraid to approach him. He looked as though he were just resting. The magnificent figure of Radhaya was lifeless. The fire in him had been quenched. Radhaya had been on the field for just seven days. Within these seven days he had achieved so much. This noble man, who had never refused anyone anything, was now dead. He had given away all he had. He was the favorite of the king. Depending on Radhaya, Duryodhan had begun the war, and Radhaya was dead. The rivers stopped flowing when Radhaya died. The sun lost his glory when Radhaya died. The earth quaked in fear and the sky was red with agony. The planets were all displaced because of this great calamity. Comets were seen even during the day. There was a cry of pain even from the gods who had assembled in the sky, pain from those who were immune to pain. Such a great fall was the fall of Radhaya. Arjun blew his Devadatta and Krishna his Panchajanya. 
It was evident that they did not blow it as lustily as they usually did. Krishn did not. Yudhishthir had gone back to his tent during the middle of the duel since he could not stay for long. He was still suffering from pain from his wounds. The two friends hurried towards the tent of Yudhishthir. Arjun jumped out of his chariot and ran to his brother. Yudhishthir was waiting for him eagerly. He had already heard about the death of Radheya. Arjun fell at his feet, the beloved feet of his honored guru and brother. Yudhishthir lifted him up and embraced him. He embraced Krishna who stood by. All the heroes were waiting to congratulate Arjun on this his greatest achievement. Arjun was very happy. Krishna said, Yudhishthir, today is a happy day toward you. With the death of Radheya the hope of Duryodhan is dead. Your anger, which was born fourteen years ago, is now burning bright, and it is burning up the Kauravs. You are already the lord of the world. Yudhishthir said, You are our hope, Krishna. You have done this for me. You are here to protect us, the Pandavs. Where is the need for worry? Yudhishthir was today rid of the worry, which had been robbing him of his sleep. He was so happy that Radheya was dead. He wanted to see him dead. He called for Arjun's chariot and, followed by his friends, proceeded to the battlefield to see the dead form of Radheya with his own eyes. He saw the three sons of Radheya lying on the field. He saw Radheya sleeping. Peacefully after the fitful fever called life. Yudhishthir looked for long at the beautiful form of Radheya and returned to his tent. He heaved a sigh of relief. He spoke nothing for a long time. The sun sloped gratefully towards the western hill. It was a day fraught with the greatest misfortune for him. It was the day when his beloved son had been killed in the battle. The son was grateful for the few hours of respite. He needed all his strength to appear again in the east next morning to usher in another day of pain. 11. With his grandfather. Duryodhan did not want to think of anything. He thought of the day of the tournament. That was when he first saw Radheya. He wanted to see him now. In the dead of the night, when the entire camp was sleeping, Duryodhan hurried to the battlefield. He saw Radheya. He sat by the side of his friend who had loved him so much. He had died for him. He just sat there looking at the handsome face of Radheya. He thought he would go mad. He rushed from there. He ran across the entire field. He ran to his grandfather who was waiting for his death. He fell at the feet of the old man and sobbed as if his heart would break. Bhishma placed his old, tired hands on the head of this unfortunate grandson of his. He said, My child, the death of Radheya had to happen. You must not grieve so much for his death. He is happy now. He was a Kshatriya and he died as a Kshatriya should. Duryodhan was startled. He said, So I am right. Radheya was a Kshatriya. Grandfather, I have all along felt that Radheya was a Kshatriya. Now you are saying the same thing. Tell me who he was. I am eager to know it. I will remove the stigma from his name at least now. I will do at least this for my friend who died for me. Tell me, Grandfather. Bhishma said, I know who he is. But I cannot tell you unless you promise me that you will not tell anyone about it. It was the wish of Radheya that no. One should know about it. He made me promise that I would not tell you about him until he died. Now that Radheya is dead I can tell you, but you must keep it a secret until you die. Duryodhan was puzzled. He said, if my beloved Radheya desired it to be a secret, I will certainly respect his wishes. I will not tell anyone about it. Tell me. Bhishma pondered for a moment. He said, Duryodhan, you are already suffering from a shock. Can you bear to hear this? Duryodhan smiled a bitter smile. He said, after seeing the dead form of my Radheya, I am still alive. Does it not prove that my heart is made of stone? I can bear anything now. Tell me, grandfather, tell me. Who is Radheya? Bhishma paused for a moment. 
He said, I will tell you. Strengthen yourself to hear the truth. Your friend was not Radhaya. He was Conte. Like the shock of sudden pain, the truth hit Duryodhan in the face. He reeled under the shock. He held on to the hands of his grandfather and said, What? Conte. Are the Pandavs the brothers of Radhaya? Tell me everything, grandfather. Bhishm told him all the painful details of the life of Radhaya. He told him about the coming of the sun to Kunthi and about the box of wood. He told him about Atirath finding the box and about the name Radhaya, how he decided on that name to be his for life. Bhishm told Duryodhan how Radhaya realized that he was not the son of Atirath. His heartbreak when Drona refused to take him as his pupil as he was a Sutputra. Then the painful episode in the Ashrama of Bhargav. Then about the tournament when his love for Duryodhan was born. Bhishma told his grandson how the two loves were the only things that mattered to Radhaya, love for Radha his mother and love for Duryodhan. He told him about the Kovach and Kundalas being given away by Radhaya because he loved a good name more than his life. Duryodhan was then told about the visits of Krishna and Kunthi. He heard all about the infinite love Radhaya had for him. Bhishma told him everything. Duryodhan sat silent. His tears were drenching the hand of his grandfather, which he was holding in his two hands. Then he spoke in a voice choked with pain, Radhaya knew, and yet he would not go to them because he loved me so. God, why am I not dead? Why does the earth stay without swallowing me up? Radhaya, my friend, I will come to you soon, as soon as I can. I cannot live without you. Bhishma tried to talk to this child who was now distraught with grief. Duryodhan braced himself up and said, Now nothing can hurt me. My mind is cleansed of all sin when I have heard about the noblest man that ever lived. I can meet death with a smile on my lips. I have learnt it from him. I am free of the love for the kingdom. I want to share it with Radhaya. I am now past all caring. I want one thing, death. I will die as a Kshatriya should. You will be proud of me, grandfather. I must go now and make preparations for my death. Duryodhan walked away without turning back. End of Karna Parva